if I've got anything. Okay. So, again, referring to the Jimbo Jones um, handout here, we're going to work through Jimbo Jones and Freedom Butterfly, maybe get into Clairvoyant a little bit. It depends on how much time we, we have with this. What we don't get today, we'll pick up on uh, next time. I want to make sure to give you enough that you can solve for uh, the homework by the time that, uh, at least one class period before it's actually, it's actually due. But I know that was a fire hose in the face, having all those uh, notes on time value of money. Time value of money is just one of the most pervasive foundation principles in all of modern finance. You know, there's some overarching principles, the relationship between risk and return, uh, time value of money, the importance of cash flows, uh, the notion of creating value. These, you know, no matter where you take finance, no matter whether it's Harding or whether it's Memphis or uh, Sanford or whatever, you're going to get those same topics. Every textbook's going to cover those, uh, those sorts of things. So um, anyway, this is also, besides a, an overarching uh, set of concepts, I think also you'll find that when it comes to actually uh, connecting material to your real, <laughs> to your actual life, uh, this material here, here has a lot of potential to help you in making better decisions because we'll be talking about loans. We'll be talking about uh, retirement plans and making investment decisions. So um, anyway, I hope you'll see that there's a, in, it's very intentional on my part, but it's also, I think, very practical to uh, work these kinds of problems. And I hope it helps to uh, bless your life uh, through your being able to better steward the resources that uh, come into your, uh, your possession and also helps you, of course, to benefit others uh, as well. Well, anyway, Jimbo Jones. Now let me say one more thing, and that is, there are four, these four building blocks. I wasn't able on the videos, I think, on the PowerPoint to show you the, the pictures that I was thinking about, but the future value of a dollar application, also known as lump sum, future value lump sum problems. I like to characterize it as uh, this way. I think visuals are very helpful, but this process, of converting a present value, the snowball at the top of the hill, to a bigger snowball at the bottom of the hill, is or is regarded as, or is often referred to as compounding. That's what that says, compounding. Uh, then the second application that's very closely related to it, present value of a dollar, is uh, uses this same, let's say, picture, except notice the direction of the arrows is different. Here we're taking a future value and converting it to a present value. This is very intuitive, I think most would say. You've seen snowballs roll down the hill. You haven't seen this happen before where a snowball rolls up the hill. Well, maybe in one of those uh, videos where somebody, you know, videotapes this then runs it backwards. Those are pretty fascinating to me. But this is really the greater, let's say the more important application to us as we'll see uh, in, uh, in the future. Now, the next one is the future value of, of an annuity and specifically what's called an ordinary annuity. And the way I characterize this or try to describe that is that you're standing at the top of the hill and you've got an ice cream scoop and you take a scoop of snow, you drop it at the top of that hill, it starts to roll downward. And as it does, of course, it gets bigger because it's attracting snow. And so it gets bigger, but also after it rolls down a certain interval, you've got, you're there with that ice cream scoop to drop one more on top of it, okay? And you continue that. And the snowball gets bigger for uh, two reasons, basically. It's because the snowball itself is attracting snow as it rolls down the hill, but also you are adding to it. Uh, this represents then, when the snowball comes to the bottom of the hill and it comes to a squeaking stop, then what you have is what's called a future value of an annuity. And these equal amounts represent payments, okay? So an annuity is simply a stream of equal payments at equal intervals. Now we've got one more, and that is the present value of an annuity. And unfortunately, you know, here you can kind of say, well, this is this in reverse. It is compounding and discounting are inverse mathematical operations. It's not really quite the same here. You can't, uh, you know, what we, what we have to understand here is essentially we're starting with a present value of annuity. We're starting uh, with a snowball at the top of the hill, and as it rolls down the hill, it gets bigger, but we're standing there with an ice cream scoop to take snowball off of it. 
and the snowball is smaller here than it was there, which means we have taken off more snow here than was, let's say, attracted to it or gained while it rolled down the hill. And that process will continue until finally the snowball rolls to the bottom of the hill and just completely fills our scoop and there's nothing left of it. So this is the present value of this stream of payments and these all represent payments. Um, we're gonna use these today, future value and present value of annuity. Present value of annuity, first of all, in uh, what are called self-amortizing loans. Uh, a lot of loans, student loans, uh, home loans, home mortgages, car loans, they're characterized as self-amortizing because you make a fixed payment over a particular period of time. And by making that payment, you're, re you're paying the rent on money. You know, interest on a loan is just rent on borrowed money. You're repaying, you're paying that interest, but you're also making a, a dent in the, uh, in the principal. You're paying back part of the loan. So by the end of that loan uh, term, that loan is completely repaid. Both all the rent on that money and all the, uh, the principal on it as well. Well, we're gonna see that first in the Jimbo Jones problem. Jimbo Jones graduated, he's got student loans, and let's work through that. It really is better if you can help me by solving the problems. If you've got your calculator, you should have. Devin, I bet you got your calculator right there. I can see you're already working on problems right now, aren't you? Okay. Um, we are, it's just, you know, you're gonna have to work the problems on the test. <laughs> It's a good idea if you can stay engaged uh, and, and work these problems and help me out here. It's also, it's better for me, it's better for you. So, Jimbo Jones, anybody know where that name comes from? That character? Okay, good, good, because it's from a Sim Simpsons. He's a Simpsons character. If you didn't know who that was, you haven't been watching that show, good. It's pretty funny, but uh, mm -hmm. I haven't seen it in years. But anyway, uh, he'll graduate from Hartley in Scarcely, where thousands live as millions wish they could. I like to say that. The student loans total 24,000, payable over 60 months at an annual rate of 4.5%. First question, what will Jimbo's monthly payments be? Well, it's important to realize that, let's see, there's part one, part A. Oops, I've got a better marker than that. Let's try this one. There we go. Um, that a self-amortizing loan like this is uh, well represented by or properly represented by the present value of annuity application. And here is what I call the usable form of that. And this is really, when I'm, I'm demonstrating this for you, not just as a freebie because, Kristen, this is what I wanna see. I wanna see you set up your problem similar to, uh, to this. And if all you do is show me your calculator inputs, you know, you and get it problem right, you'll get most of the points, but you won't get all of them because I'm looking for work. I'm looking for your documentation. And if you've got a better way to document your work, you know, once we're done with this, you say, well, I've got an even better way, Johnson, than the one you show me. I am all ears. Bonnie, I'm a lifelong learner. I'm very happy to know what those are. But for now, uh, go with me and adopt this approach right here. I think you'll find it's very useful not just in setting up basic problems. You may find this a bit of overkill in solving a basic problem, but when it comes to putting together problems, the more complex ones, like we will, I think it's very, a very good format. I haven't found anything better, and I've been looking, Izaku, for better ways to do things. But anyway, so I want you to get on board here with this approach, not just with uh, being able to solve problems. Keep in mind, it's, it's about being able to demonstrate document your work so that someone following it work, me in this case, uh, so it's easier rather than more difficult for me to, uh, to follow your work. So here we have the present value annuity formula and we need to plug in what we know. It says what will Jimbo's monthly payments be? So we're solving for this guy right here, for that payment amount. The present value is the principal, the amount that uh, he borrowed, 24,000 and it's really important that you start to get comfortable with these inputs. Um, and off, very often I think it just, it's important to refer back to those definitions. And I'll try to encourage you to do that. $24,000, that's the amount of the loan balance at the inception of the loan, how much he uh, owes to start with. 
failure, of course, is going to be the uh, payments that he makes, the periodic, or in this case, monthly payments. N is the total number of times compounding takes place over the investment term. This is an annuity, so it so happens for our purposes uh, that the number of payments and the, and the number of times compounding takes place are going to be the same. And so in this case, it's apparently it's a five-year loan with monthly payments, so monthly compounding, N is equal to 60. Of course, it gives us that too, doesn't it? 60 monthly payments at an annual rate of 4.5%. So that's 4.5% divided by 12. Here's where you, again, uh, understanding and uh, let's say embedding in your, in your thinking these definitions is pretty important. I is the periodic rate of return. The annual rate of return divided by the number of times compounding or discounting takes place each year. So 4.5% is the annual rate, but because we've got monthly payments, we have got monthly compounding. Um, as a matter of fact, working with your calculator here, solving for these problems, you're not going to be able really to, well, it's going to be uh, the basic assumption we're going to make. It is possible you've got a loan, let's say, where interest is compounded annually, but you've got monthly payments, and we can work those, but we'd have to use Excel uh, to do that. How many of you uh, are comfortable with Excel? How many of you are not so comfortable? Where do you have it? Do you have an IS? Claim, but you don't feel like you've got the, okay, we're going to work into it. Okay, that's, that's important for me to know. Um, work into it because these problems, as you're going to see, are pretty much tailor-made for, um, uh, for spreadsheets. A lot of repetitive calculations. <laughs> Life's too short for us to do it ourselves. Uh, but, you know, we need to do it now to be able to demonstrate that we know what the calculator is doing. But uh, pretty quickly, it would be nice to, well, we're letting the calculator do a lot of work for us, aren't we? Well, anyway, here we go. So 24,000 goes in as your present value. So I'm gonna open up the calculator. I'm using my iPad to record this uh, for our remote access students or anyone who's, who's missing. And so I'm having to use my phone instead of, which is really small. 24,000, that's my, that's my present value. N is 60, so 60, hit, then hit N. And then 4.5 divided by 12 equals, it's 0.375, but I think I told you on the video, I really encourage you, calculate that periodic rate of return, and once you see it in the display, just press the I key. It installs that value. Sometimes they're kind of ugly, you know, they kind of go on and on. And so it's, uh, it's going to be better for you if you just get in the habit of letting, letting the calculator do what it does well. Uh, these these calculations, let's see. So compute, payment, and I get 447.43. Is that what others get? Now I'm gonna just, let's just use dollars here. Uh, it's gonna really be easier for us in real life. Of course, in a, using a spreadsheet uh, like Excel, letting it calculate cents is fine, but let's say that uh, for our purposes, getting to the nearest dollar is, is fine. Did you, uh, you divided with I, right? Uh, I get to get I, I divide 4.5% the annual rate by 12. Okay, and the one you put, you input into the calculator, you divide it again with the result of that? Well, no, th well, this is what I'm doing in the calculator. For instance, I'm, letting, I'm saying 4.5 divided by 12 equals, and then I'm putting that in. Okay. So really I'm just saying here, this is what I'm doing in the calculator. So 447, do others get that? This is my way of asking you, okay, so then we're good. Part D, what, um, how much interest will Jimbo pay, assuming he pays the loan off according to schedule? Yeah, Bonnie? Um, was the problem with the three, if you left the I and 4.5% and then you did the A, you would get the number? In other words, you take this off of the annual payment and divide by 12? Or like you just do 60 divided by 12 Oh yeah, if you said five here, 4.5, and then you got an annual amount, you divide that by 12, okay. you, you'd have to do that, it wouldn't be the same. Okay. Yeah, you'd, you're kind of ignoring, you, yeah, ignoring uh, monthly compounding if you do that. I'll be looking for that. Um, okay, so the total of all his payments is 
447, again, I'm ignoring the change there. It's less than a, I think 447.43 or something times 60. That gives us the total of the payments that he's going to be making. Okay, so I'm 60. Actually, I've got it, that number in my calculator. It actually comes out to 26,846. That is leaving no sense in there. Your, your, your answer, if you use just 447, is, is going to come up very close to that anyway. Um, maybe off by $20, $30. Subtract the 24000 that he borrowed, and the difference represents interest on the loan. Anything that you pay above and beyond the amount borrowed represents interest. And interest is simply what? Interest is simply rent on borrowed money. That's all it is. Rent on borrowed money. And so in order, by financing his education this way, as opposed to paying $24,000 today to get out from under this loan, if he does in fact pay it over time, he pays this much in interest. Okay? Let's see, question C says, oh, produce a loan amortization schedule. To do this, then I want to erase part of, I think I can, I'm gonna erase this right here. Are we okay with that? Let me see how far I can go over here. To, let's see, can I go there? I'll tell you what, let me write it over here. I'll, let me get rid of this guy. Because I don't need that. But let me leave that there and let me do a loan amortization schedule. A loan amortization schedule simply shows how a loan is paid off, how it's killed. Actually, the word, uh, well, you're familiar with, from accounting with amortization, uh, and it's, the root of that is uh, the same root for mortician or mortuary, <laughs> is to die. And so uh, amortization schedule shows how a loan is, uh, how it dies, how it's killed uh, over its life. There are, there are a few different ways to set this up, but the first one is, uh, I'm gonna set it up fairly simply here. There's the period, there's the payment, the interest, uh, the principal, and the balance. Let me see, see if this is gonna show up over here. Let me slide this over just a little bit. Payment. Uh, excuse me, period payment, interest, principal, and balance. I'm going to abbreviate this just to give myself a little, little more room there. Interest, principal, and the balance. The balance, of course, the amount that he owes. And I usually like to start out with uh, zero time periods. I'm not sure if we'll do three periods. I think that's what it calls for in this example here. But here's uh, time period zero, that is the date of the start of the loan. And I like to put that in because that gives me uh, a way to, to put the beginning balance in without having a separate column. You know, you could have a separate column for beginning balance and then a column for ending balance, but <laughs> you know, the ending balance uh, for one period is the beginning for the next, and so it's a bit, a bit redundant. Well, we know that these payment amounts are 447. I'm gonna leave all the dollar signs out because that's, we know we're dealing with dollars here other than this obvious column here. Well, what we're gonna show here is how this loan is going to be eliminated, how it's gonna be reduced over 60 periods to, to zero. But one thing we have to notice that is every, here is that every payment consists of uh, interest for that period, and then uh, a portion that goes to repay the principal. First thing we can on that uh, for that particular month. So interest for any given period, here's the basic calculation formula, is principal times rate times time. You probably had that in econ classes, in accounting classes, we see it again here, very simple formulation. Principal, the balance on the loan that is subject to interest, and right now at the beginning it's $24,000. The rate, and I like to use the annual rate here so that then we can define time in terms of the period for which we are calculating interest. Since we're doing this for month, for each month, then that represents uh, 1 12th of the year. 24,000 times 0.045 times 1 12, or 24,000 times 0.045 divided by 12 will give you the same result. 
Tell me what you get as the interest for that first period. Kristen, you've got that, don't you? 90. 90, okay. So there's the interest, and that goes right here. Well, the payment for that period was $447. Of that amount, $90 was interest, and the difference goes toward repaying the loan, and that's what, 357? And so imagine at the, at the end of that first month, you make your payment of 447, 90 of that, of course, is just rent on that $24,000 for that month. The other 357 goes to pay down the loan. So immediately after that payment, you don't owe 24,000, you owe 23,643. Okay, 23,643. Now notice, uh, you'll have a problem very similar to this on the test and usually people knock the socks off of it, but uh, you know, there are several places where you get turned around. One is, Bonnie, as a matter of fact, what you just mentioned, not defining properly N or I, and uh, sometimes I'll throw in something like it's a car loan. I'll give you an example of that uh, in homework. A car loan, and then maybe there's a down payment. So, for instance, if you're buying a car for 30,000, but you're putting down $5,000 on that, how much are you borrowing? You buy a car for $30,000, you're making $5,000 down payment, then uh, how much are you financing? 25, yeah, the difference there. So, you know, you just want to be aware of that so you don't try to finance 30,000 instead, uh, uh, instead of the 25 in that case. Well, let's uh, go through the second loan here. So this would be what we call the payoff at the, right after that first payment. If you came into some money and wanted to get out from under this loan, and I'd usually say, think carefully about that. Student loan money is as cheap as you'll ever get. <laughs> well, home mortgage um, interest is probably even lower than that. So unless you've got a real uh, good motivation for wanting to get out from under a home loan, uh, you know, any excess amount you have that could go toward repaying that, think about putting that into an investment that's gonna earn you seven, eight, 10, 12% as opposed to down, you know, paying off a 4% uh, home loan early. Um, okay, so anyway, when we get to the second, so that's, that would be the payoff at that time. Interest for period two. Now, we've got 23,643 that's subject to that interest. 4.5% times 112. I'm just trying to maintain some constant or consistency in the uh, approach here. Now it's gonna be less, isn't it? Less than 90 because we've, uh, the amount subject to interest has dropped down. As a matter of fact, as we go down, you would see just a, um, a steady progression, you know, in uh, decline, which means less money, of this payment, less money going toward interest, more money going toward principal. So then in the last few months, you've got very little interest and almost all of your payment is going toward repaying that principal. What do we get here is about 88 bucks, 88, Savannah, how much? 88, 63. 63. Well, let me round that off there. That's what I'm doing. So that's 89. If we took this out to cents, it would be a little more precise, but that means we've got 358 going toward repaying the loan. 13 times 8 plus 5. Let's see, 13 minus 8 is 5, am I right? 13 minus 5 is 9, 5 minus 3 is 2, 22, 23, 295. Maybe too close to this. How about that, is that right? 285. 285, thanks. 23, 285. I used to be good at math until I got a calculator. It's one of those things, if you travel to Japan, for instance, you'll see clerks in stores that will just whip out that money, you know, make a change in their head, and it's always right. <laughs> yes, Savannah? Um, can you go over where we get the principal again? Yeah, the principal amount is going to be the amount subject to interest. So when we first started out, it was the 24 grand that he, that he owed. But notice with that first month, he actually repaid this amount. Here's his payment, but notice this is one of those mistakes that some will, uh, common mistakes, and that is 
you'll, you'll, some of you will want to deduct the full payment in arriving at this new balance, but it's only the principal, right, repayment. Uh, the, you don't get a deduction from the rent uh, on the money, the interest. Okay, we good there? Next one then, we've got a new balance, and so interest for period three is 23,285 times, well, same old, same old. You see why, maybe get an idea as to why, how this would really be uh, a good application for Excel, because once you get those formulas in there, you just do the drag, or, or the highlight and drag down. As a matter of fact, when I do that myself, I like to kind of feels good to make a sound that goes along with it. So what's our interest here? Somebody tell me, please. 87.32. Okay, so 87, round it off, 87, that means this is what, 356? And Is that it? Twenty-two. We good? Yeah. Twenty-two nine. Three. Do what? Oh, thanks. Yeah, I did that just to check. Yeah, good job. Three sixty. So that changes this, doesn't it? Nine two five. Nine two five. Yes, sir. Twenty-two. Thanks. See if I can just bum that up. <laughs> make a, make a mess out of it. Okay. There we go. How about them apples? So you can probably imagine how you drag that thing down. You know, once you get the formulas in the cells, just copy that down. I've got one of these for my own home loan because I'm, you know, I just told you guys don't pay those loans off early because the interest is, you know, at a rate that you'll never get better to put the, uh, that you'll never get as low uh, anywhere else but, and you'll be better off putting money aside. But, you know, I'm just, have a, people have other goals. One of those is to, you know, own a, own a house free and clear. And so uh, when we moved here, I just decided I wanted to pay this loan off in five years and instead of uh, whatever it was set up for, 15 or 30 or something. And so that's what we're, uh, what we're doing. Well, um, anyway, there's the loan amortization schedule. Next, how much will he owe immediately after making the 10th payment? Um, let me come over here for this one. But let's see, that was A, we did part B, this was part C, and now D. Well, here's one way we could, uh, we could do that. We could crank out the loan amortization schedule for 10 periods and look at that last column. Laney, life's too short, isn't it? Um, I had a student who did that one time. She, I remember it was here at Harding. She was an accounting student, actually very sharp. Uh, and there was this, this question on the test, and on the back of one of the pages, she had cranked out a loan amortization schedule for like, I don't know if it was 10 or 12 or 15 periods. Now usually on a test you don't have that much leisure time, you know, to do that. As it turned out, uh, it's a much easier matter than that because what we have to realize is that, uh, like, we, like we knew here, that this, um, this amount here represents the present value of the stream of payments. In this case, we knew the present value and we solved for the payment. But we can solve pretty easily for the present value, knowing the payments. And so essentially the amount that she owes after that 10th payment is the present value of the remaining payments. Well, there were 60 payments to begin with. She's paid 10, so how many remain? So n is 50, and this guy here hasn't changed any. 4.5% divided by 12. <clears throat> so we solve for the present value of those payments. Second clear TVM, uh, 447 is the payment. 50 is N, 4.5, I know what it is, but I'm gonna go through the motions here. Divided by 12 equals is I compute present value, 
and tell me what you get. What? What did you divide 12 with? 4.5? Yeah, uh, in, in putting these values, I put in 447 in payment, 50 is in, then I said 4.5 divided by 12 equals, and that value I, pre I put it into I. That represents the periodic, in this case, a monthly rate of return. Part of it, I certainly hope, is the case that by Repeating these, you know, you become very comfortable with them in the process. Yeah, Bonnie. Um, why don't you change the 4.5 to some zero 4.5? Ah, that's a good question. I could have, but the calculator is going to require it in percent form. So when I end, I'm thinking about calculator values here. So in the calculator, to put in 4.5%, you put in 4.5. That's. A, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's another, I won't say common, mistake, but if you don't get that straight, you probably miss them all. I mean, anytime you have to put in a percentage, if you're trying to put it in a decimal form to the calculator, when it's expecting it to be in percent form, you're not going to get any of them right. Which is okay on homework, <laughs> but it's not, uh, I think, I was trying to remember, was it your class or the other one? Like, I think it was this most recent one, I, well, great, this five point of problems, I made some comments on some of you because you, you know, you were having trouble with geometric mean return. I think it was uh, mo mostly that was the issue, and so I think several people were doing that. So I made a comment. You know, you know you're having trouble with GMR. Make sure you look at the uh, the answer key, and if you have any questions, give me a holler. Okay, so we good on that? This is what would be called the payoff in this loan. On this loan, in the old days, when you bought a, let's say, when you bought a car or you had a loan like this, they'd probably send you an amortization schedule, they would, or they would send you a payment book, and the payment book would show the amount of each payment. You would send that in with your check, and if you paid late, there was a penalty. But they also, on that payment book, I remember it would show you, here's how much you owe. But it wasn't the correct amount. It wasn't the amount you owed. It was the total of the remaining payments. Well, if you pay off a loan early, for instance, if you paid this loan off right here, he would owe this amount of money which means he would avoid all the interest from here on out. You don't owe the interest for future periods, okay? So this payoff of the loan, but as a matter of fact, if you had a, if you wanted to pay off your student loan or a car loan or something like that, you really would have to talk with the lender and they would have to give you a date. They would say, if you paid it off tomorrow, here's what it would be. The day after that, it's gonna be a little bit more. The day after that, because of accrued interest over the space of one day. Um, yeah, they, I think I missed it, but um, how did you go from 60 to, to 50 again on the end? Um, because this was the original amount, but uh, the 60 months uh, life of the loan, but in that part D it says how much will he owe immediately after making the 10th payment? So we're saying, okay, 10, 10, 10 payments have been made, so now he 50 payments remain okay. on this loan. So we would get the same answer, by the way, if we crunched the numbers here, but life's too short for that. Okay, now we get the fun stuff. Number two, uh, I like these retirement problems, hint, hint, because as you'll see, we can incorporate all four building blocks, future value of a dollar, present value of a dollar, of course, future value and present value of annuity. As a matter of fact, on the uh, note sheet, You've already seen the applications for future value and present value of annuity applied to a retirement uh, circumstance, but we're going to do some more of those things. Uh, first of all, let's look at the problem. Number two, Freedom Butterfly. She's up in uh, Eureka Springs. You guys know where Eureka Springs is? It's an artsy community. Uh, used to be a sort of a hangout of the rich and famous back in early 1900s, I think, because there were some springs, you know, that were supposed to have. Uh, medicinal or some kind of health qualities. But anyway, it's an artsy place right now. So, 
Freedom Butterfly, age 25, believes interest in investment accounts are a fiction devised by exploitative elements of modern society to fuel consumerism and ultimately to exploit the poor. You find some people that believe that. <laughs> Now, I'll tell you later on that we found that there's a recognition of the time value of money even in relatively primitive uh, types of, of settings. That is, having the money, getting your money today rather than tomorrow is, is a good thing. <laughs> it's better than waiting uh, for the future. Anyway, I'm just kind of having a go at that mindset right now. This, um, yeah, it's all about oppression. Still, she does plan to stop working in about 25 years and wants to continue to eat three meals per day. In other words, she says, well, I don't really like this, but I, I do want to uh, plan for my own future, be able to provide for myself. So, um, so 25 years. So she's 25 years old, think about this. She plans to work for 25 more years and then she wants to retire. Um, so, uh, she wants to continue to eat three meals a day, specifically now. She plans to contribute $1,000 per month into an investment account that's expected to earn 7% annually. Upon retirement, she plans to transfer the balance to an account earn, earning about 5%. Assuming she believes her account will earn 7% compounded monthly, that's uh, simply a restatement. I would have probably left that out since it's already in there. Uh, during, her retire, during her earning years, what's the most she can withdraw monthly for 30 years of retirement? So actually right now, probably it's a good idea that that sentence that says, assuming she believes her account will earn 7% compounded monthly, just cross through that. <clears throat> and that last sentence should simply be, what's the maximum amount she can withdraw? Again, because that 7% is already in the, uh, the narrative there. Okay, we're starting into retirement problems. The very practical applications of time value of money, and there are, in this case, there, I want you to see that there are two basic periods that we're going to be dealing with. There are, there's a period called the earning years. Where she's making money and contributing that to a retirement account. And then there are the retirement years. So she's got a working years and her post working years. I really think setting up timelines is a good way, especially if you say, like a lot of students do, that you're a visual learner, that setting up these timelines to let you see exactly what's happening, you know, how much is coming in or going and when. And so we're going to do that here. Well, as it turns out, the most basic form of these retirement problems is going to involve, over here, a future value of annuity application. And over here, a present value of annuity application. You will always have these elements. You may have something more than that, as you'll see when we start dealing with more realistic, uh, that is, complex type problems. But again, we're starting at the very, with the most basic of, uh, of assumptions here. You've got two periods, the early years and the retirement years. During this period, you're putting money aside, you're, say, you're investing to build up a future value at, at retirement. Here, you're starting with that as your, uh, let's say, your retirement nest egg, and you're drawing down from that. You're taking money out of that. Okay, so my question is here, look at this, uh, take a, a little while and just look at this problem. My question is, first of all, where is the hole? That is, where's the unknown? Are we trying to solve for something over here in retirement years, uh, or are we trying to solve for something over here? Are we trying to figure out how long her money will provide her in retirement, or what rate of return she must earn, or how much money she can take out in retirement? Or are we talking about solving for how much money she needs to put in, or how long she needs to uh, continue to contribute to retirement? or what rate of return she must earn. You know, think about it. They're really, in every one of these equations we've seen, there are four variables, aren't they? <laughs> we can solve, for, if we have three of those, we can always solve for the fourth one if you know how to set it up and, of course, let the calculator do what it does well. Uh, your task is to be able to identify, you know, which formulas are appropriate for a given problem, and then, of course, to be able to properly identify the, uh, identify the inputs. What's the main way you differentiate from these two? Like 
Here you're saving up and here you're drawing down. I'm in my earning years, but I'm, I'm here in my earning years. <laughs> and we'll see, looking at, it's a good question. We're gonna be looking at some, uh, well, a basic problem. Then I'm gonna throw some other things and say, what if? And we'll see how that changes things and how we sometimes have to move back from over here to over here. If you get over here, well, you tell me on this one, are we, uh, where's the hole? Where's the unknown? Are we solving for something over here? Are we solving for something over here? Kristen, you nodded your head when I said over here, okay? Because it's asking what? Yeah, how much are you gonna be able to take out in retirement? So we, if that's the case, if the hole is over here, then we gotta start over here, don't we? We got everything we need to figure out how much money she's gonna have in retirement. And then we'll use that to figure out what that means, what that's gonna mean in terms of providing for her in terms of monthly payments. Okay, so let's plug this in. So she's gonna contribute $1,000 per month. She's planning to stop working in 25 years, so her earning years are gonna be 25 years times 12. What is that, 300? Okay, N is 300 and I is, let's see, 7%. Divided by 12. Let's go ahead and solve for that, and then we'll go to the other portion, the other part of the problem. So let me clear out the calculator. 1,000 is payment. 300 is M. 7 divided by 12 equals, and that's a really ugly number, <laughs> and it goes on even further. I don't have to worry about how far out it goes. I'm just going to say put that value because it's not just what's in the display, it's what's in the calculator's memory, and it goes out further than the, what, five, six decimal places even that I've got on display. Now I have those values of that. Compute future value. 810 72. I'm, I'm avoiding, uh, by the way, again, all the dollar signs here. I sometimes may slip up and put them in, but we know we're talking about dollars, and uh, I'd rather not bum things up too much with uh, yet one more uh, symbol or, some, or a number or something. So she's going to have 810072. Let's think about what's happened here. Um, Let's say she's standing right here today. She's smiling because she's in finance class, by the way. But uh, she said, you know what? I really need to get cooking on my retirement, and I think I can put aside $1,000 a month. Now, she says, not today, but you know, starting today, I'm gonna save up. And so out of my monthly check at the end of this month, I'm gonna put my first $1,000 aside. And so that's where this comes from. The, this is what's called an ordinary annuity in that the payments are made or received at the end of each period. The loan problem that we worked on, that's, a, that's an ordinary annuity. Most retirement type problems are ordinary annuities. So we don't deal much with the alternative, which is called an annuity due, where the payments are made at the beginning of a period. You could do that. As a matter of fact, we could change the setting on the calculator to solve for that. Annuities due, really, uh, the, the primary application of those is in leases because typically you have to make your lease payment at the beginning of a, uh, the lease period, don't you? Not at the end. But anyway, we don't deal with those months. An ordinary annuities are really what are critical, uh, or let's say that's the most common application or most commonly used. Uh, okay, now we've got 810,000. Now it's retirement date. Um, and she, you know, they, uh, she retires, blows out the candles on her cake, they give her the watch, and she, uh, uh, security escorts, like the security escorts her to the door. You know, they changed all the passwords, taking her keys away, made sure she's not taking staplers or office supplies and stuff. And she goes home, logs into the computer, and she just checks and sees that just out of today, at the end of her, her last month of retirement uh, of earning years, the that she has contributed a thousand dollars out of her paycheck to the retirement plan. And now she look, she's looking at a balance of $810,072.
$810,072. But notice what was the future value of all her efforts in her earning years, all her investments, is the present value of her retirement uh, fund, or in this case, retirement annuity. And so she's made certain assumptions about how long she's going to be in retirement is how long she's going to live. <laughs> it's kind of grisly to think about that, but believe me, uh, you got to think about it. Uh, my, uh, my parents both passed away in 2019. My mom was 95, my dad was 93. And don't think that that doesn't weigh on me in terms of how long I need to provide for myself. Not that I would want it much shorter than that, but you know, there is such a thing as living too long. And some of you have grandparents or something that uh, maybe great grandparents and they've uh, experienced mental and physical decline, you know, I don't want to live that long. Um, but you certainly don't want to be in a position of imposing a financial burden on those who, who remain. It's going to be a, uh, we've seen situations, we came close with my parents of not having enough of their resources to be able to provide for them. And nobody wants to leave their kids, you know. Uh, it's enough of an emotional burden to take care of them. Um, but to have the financial burden on top of that, well, None of us wants that. But to avoid that, you're gonna to have to plan ahead. Uh, so, um, anyway, she's planning to live, what, 30, 30 years, 30 times 25 is, no, excuse me, 30 times 12, 360. So, and is 360 months, but also notice that uh, she is transferring funds to a more conservative, well, let's say it's earning 5%. That's the implication here. If she's transferring funds to a, uh, or uh, 810,072 to an account expected to earn only 5%. What, I, what I'm implying by that is that there is less risk, you know, associated with that. When you're young, you've got enough time uh, to recover, you know, from maybe uh, a downturn in the market or maybe even investing mistakes. You can work longer if you're still in the job market. If you get to be 75 or 80 years old and you're drawing down on your retirement, say, man, I don't have enough. Um, that's not a good feeling. It's not a good situation to be in. Let's see. David, you have a question? Yeah, I, I okay. multiplied um, 30 with 20, with 12, you said, to get 360? 30 times 12, yeah. And so we want to solve for payment here. So we clear out the calculator, check and clear TVM, 81072 is your PV, 360 is in, 5 divided by 12 equals, by the way, you have to hit the equal sign if you're doing it the way I encourage you to. Don't put, if you put in 5 divided by 12 and then you simply press the I key, you're installing 12 into that cell. That's not going to give you the right answer. 5 divided by 12 equals. And then, you know, once you've basically completed that division, then you can uh, install that value. So 5 divided by 12, I think that's an ugly number, isn't it, of some kind? So anyway, payment. What do we get here? Four thousand. See. Lainey, what do you have there? I have four thousand three hundred forty-eight. Okay. Four thousand three forty-eight. So here's what we're saying. Here's retirement date. By the way, these are actually the very same day. <laughs> Okay, and uh, this is the this is a month later, and she's able to take this amount of money out. Here's a month later, and she's taking that money out. And anyway, this and when she takes out that very last payment, four thousand three forty eight. There's nothing. That's that ice cream, you know, that snowball that rolls into that ice cream scoop, you know, and fills it up completely. No more, no less, and that's the that zeroes out her retirement account. She goes and jumps into a volcano, and ends it all, or begs somebody to pull the plug. Um, okay. Now, how how are we doing on that? Um, the twelve the twelve that was multiplied by the thirty uh, represents a month. Or yes. Yeah. Yeah, we've defined this. She, she wants to withdraw amounts and monthly payments. So this has to be the monthly payment. This has to be the number of months. This has to be the monthly rate. Yeah, it's really important. I'm glad you mentioned that, Dave. 
it's important to get all these to be consistent, to, to get all these, uh, these amounts right. Well, so we come back to freedom and say 4,348. You know, that's how much you'll have. Well, there's all kinds of different ways we could go with this. Let me see if I can think of one. Yeah, let's say that she says, uh, you know, this is different from what I did in the earlier class. But let's, let's say she says, and how much am I going to have there left over after that as a kind of a cushion or to leave to, uh, uh, to uh, a good cause or to my kids or something like that? And you say, well, nothing. I mean, this is the, if you take out the maximum by definition, if you take out the maximum monthly, there can't be anything left over, right? So she says, oh, I didn't know that. She said, I tell you what, I want to, uh, I'd like to leave, let's say, um, $100,000, you know, of course, 100000 now and 100000 in, what, 30 years? Well, actually, she's looking 50 years down the line, down the road, uh, uh, down the, uh, the line, isn't she? So, but it, let's leave it at that. Let's say that she says, I want to, let's say I want to leave, I'll make it more than that. Let's say she wants to leave 500000 You're going to think, well, that's going to be hard if you've only got eight ten. Let's see. Let's say she wants to leave $500,000 at her death for uh, some good cause. Uh, maybe to, to sponsor a bagpipe band at Harding University. I think that would be a very, very good cause for someone to, to sponsor. A pipe and drum band. The Thundering Herd Pipes and Drums. It just has a ring to it. I'm an idea guy. Jordan, you, you run with it and make it a reality, okay? Well, in other words, she's saying, this is, not, this is not everything I want to be able to take out. I also want to have something left over at the end. So she says, how, how can I make that happen? So what we have to do is we go back and say, all right, then in addition to what we've got here, you're telling me that you want to leave A certain amount at at your death. Well, that's a future value. Okay, so future value, by the way, of a single amount because it's five hundred thousand. She wants to leave. So, m equals i equals. Well, these are going to be the same, really, because that money is going to be in that same fund. So, m is three sixty. I is 5% divided by 12. And as it turns out, the calculator can solve this without any, uh, without breaking much of a sweat. Let me see if I've got this. Uh, you can see that. It's not, not pretty, but you can see it. Okay, so here's what we've, what we get, we've got here. She's got a present value uh, in her retirement account, the amount of 810,000 and change. Uh, she wants to be able to take out the most monthly that she can while still leaving $500,000 at her, at her death, okay, at, at 80 years old, at the end of her retirement. She may be thinking too, well, eh, it's kind of a cushion too. If I get there and I'm not ready to die, <laughs> then I may want to use that 500,000, but, uh, so let's see what we've got here. First of all, 810,072. 810,072. And I'm going to make that a negative, as if to say you're going to be spending this amount of money today in order to be able to take this amount out in the future. So I'm going to make that a negative, 810,072. That's present value. I'm going to put in that 500,000 as a future value, it's a positive amount because this is money basically going into the fund, this is coming out. So that's 500,000 and that is a future value. I've got N is 360 and I is five divided by 12 equals, and I'm gonna compute payment. Got the payment computed now. Notice, I, there's no reason to put these in twice. <laughs> They're the same thing. If you, put, if you put these values in here, N and I, then you put them again, you're simply replacing these, same value, these values with the same amounts. So uh, who's got that? What did you get for that? $3,748. 